Eagles Entertainment. Hi, Eagles everywhere, and welcome to the Eagles Insider Podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. I'm Insider Dave Spadaro at the NovaCare Complex. It's Wednesday, and the Eagles getting ready to entertain fans in the stands on Sunday at Lincoln Financial Field. If you missed it, please take a listen to Tuesday's special edition of the Eagles Insider Podcast featuring an interview with President Don Smolensky. The Eagles making all kinds of preparations for bringing in as many as 7,500 fans, including the players, the staff, the operations people, everyone in the building totaling up to 7,500 people on Sunday against the Baltimore Ravens. We've got a great podcast for you here. We're going to talk to Travis Fulgham. All of a sudden, he's a star wide receiver with the Eagles, right? Two games in, he's the go-to receiver on the outside. We're going to get into his past and what he thinks about his present and his future in just a bit. We'll also visit with voice of the Ravens, Jerry Sandusky, talking about the 4-1 and Baltimore Ravens and their dynamic quarterback, Lamar Jackson. Let's begin, as we normally do on Wednesday, with our exclusive one-on-one with head coach Doug Peterson. The Eagles coming off a tough loss in Pittsburgh, looking to beat Baltimore, another AFC North Giants. We welcome you, Eagles everywhere, to our weekly one-on-one with head coach Doug Peterson. Doug, 1-3-1 and is obviously not where you want to be, but do you feel like the team is moving in the right direction? I do feel like the team is moving in the right direction, and we took some steps forward, you know, Sunday, even though even though we lost the game. I I, I look back, I look back on this last month of of football, right? These last five games, and 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 everything. It, it's a lot of self inflicted, you know, uh, mistakes and and things that you go all the way back to the Washington game where. You know, the, the the turnovers, the sacks, couldn't get off the field defensively in the second half. Then you go to the Rams game, and, and it was a little bit of execution. But, there, you know, Rams are obviously a, a good football team, and you know you're going to have to keep up with scoring. And, and we just didn't execute enough in that game. And then, of course, you know, the Bengals game had opportunities there. We failed to, failed to execute there. And then great win, San Francisco on the road, tough place to play you know, East coast, West coast and played, you know, played, played good. We won the turnover ratio that day and uh, we, we scored on defense, uh, which is all part of, you know, part of the process. And then, and then, you know, yesterday uh, or, you know, this past Sunday, um, same types of thing. I mean, we, when you have nine penalties in the football game and eight of them, obviously on the defensive side, which created five additional first downs for the opponent, you know, you can't get off the field on third down. Red zone, I believe they were 100% in the red. I mean, those are the situational aspects. We spend a lot of time talking and practicing situational football, and 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 we're going to have to spend more time, and we're going to have to talk more about third down and red zone and situational football um, and win the turnover battle, you know. And that's, that's what's happening. I don't – guys are playing hard. Guys are – you know, busting their tail out there. We are playing with some some young guys on offense, obviously, but um, it's all been sort of sort of self inflicted these these first five games. On defense, how do you get it to the level where you know you can be on a consistent basis? Defensively, I think you know because we do have some some veteran players over there, and 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 for the most part, um, you know these guys are. Are, are sort of you know battle tested. They've been in some big games. They just have to continue to play and just just keep, you know, one thing one thing that we've got to do better at, and I got to continue to strive with the football team is we got to be a smarter football team, a little more disciplined football team, and that starts in practice during the week. It just doesn't, it's just not lip service, and then we just go show up and do it on game day, right? You got to do it in in practice, and and if we're making those small little mistakes in practice, well, then they're going to show up in the game. And, and that's what's happening. So it starts with our preparation. Um, you know, I talk, talk to the guys on, on how they prepare during the week and, and, and are they doing enough during the week. And, you know, and it's all part of the – the coach is doing enough, right, to prepare the players. So everybody has a hand uh, in everything. And, um, you know, we, we, we we're on the right track. We showed improvement. We're, we're, we're moving in the right direction. And, and I know one day everything's going to flip and, and uh, be in our favor. Right, so in practice now, when you see mistakes, do you blow the whistle and say, run it again? 
Do you already do that? I mean, we we what changes? yeah no we all we do that anyway. That's something that we constantly. It's all it's all about positive reinforcement, right? And and it, it, even if a even if say an offensive lineman uh, made the wrong block, one of the things I like to do is just kind of stop the drill. Let's re- reload the play. Even if they have to walk through it, right, step through it, I just want him to have positive reinforcement. Like, okay, this is how it's done, right? So the last thing he did was something positive. And and that's the same way with, you know, somebody that jumps off sides or if there's a, you know, a, a, a defensive penalty in the secondary or a false start or whatever it might be, uh, being able to kind of stop that right there, coach it up, detail it up, and then that way hopefully it doesn't take over on game day. Sunday, it's such an unusual challenge. Lamar Jackson presents many, many difficulties. Um, and it's kind of the first time you've seen that kind of quarterback. So how do you approach it defensively? What, what challenges does Baltimore bring to the table? Well, that, I mean, obviously you got to stop their run game. You know, that's that's the biggest thing offensively. And, and, and they're, they're, they're dynamic with what they do. He's obviously electric. He, he makes the first, second, sometimes the third guy miss. Uh, it's going to take a full team effort, 11, 11 bodies, you know, flying to the football. Um, and and just, you know, uh, the teams that have had success um, against them are the ones that have been able to sort of nullify their run game and try to keep, you know, keep a great athlete like Lamar sort of at check. And, and that's that's obviously, you know, hard to do. Uh, but it's going to take it's going to take all 11 guys on defense again, flying to the football, uh, you know, for that to happen. Doug, it's been exciting to see Travis Fulgham the last couple of weeks. So I guess I'll ask the question that every Eagles fan wants you to answer the right way. Is he the real deal? I, I think he is. I mean, again, this is a guy that's, you know, he, he's played in games before. And and not just our games, but, but you know, in Detroit. And, um, you know, so he's, he's, a, he's a veteran. He's young, but he's a veteran-type player. He understands. He, he works extremely hard. Um, you know, at practice, uh, he, he's one of those guys, when you talk about preparation and hard work, uh, you know, he, he, he's putting in the time. Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, there are some things that we can continue to coach with him and some of the detailed things with him as he continues to learn, you know, the offense. But, you know, we try to just put him in a position to let his talent shine. Carson's getting more comfortable with him each week. And it's uh, it's positive and good to see, and it's something we can build on. It, th- there's an upside here with Travis. I mean, measurably, the way he runs, how physical he is. Th- there's something here. Yeah, I mean, he, he's a big physical. He's, he's he's in that same sort of Alshon Jeffrey mold, right? Where you got those big, tall, lanky, lengthy guys that are physical, got great, strong hands, just like Alshon has. Um, and and he's you know he 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 loves to play physical. When you watch him run block. Um, you know, he, he, he's, he's run blocking DBs 5, 10, 15 yards down the field, and, and uh, he doesn't shy away from that. And uh, he's got great speed, good length. Uh, he, can, he can separate. He can get behind defenders, as we saw in San Francisco. And then, and then the contested catch. You saw, you know, Sunday balls that were thrown in his area, right, might be up high or behind him a touch or wherever. But he's able to, you know, make those contested catches because of his, his length, his body size, his physicality, and that's really, uh, really good to see. If I may go on about Travis for a moment here, it, he has played in the league, but he's never played like he played on Sunday <laughs> in the league. It's like he's, it's like he's come from nowhere. I mean, you've seen this happen over the course of your time in the NFL. Well, and, how and, does this happen? Yeah, you know, and it, it's it's sometimes with younger players too. You know, um, there's not a lot of tape out there, right? So there's not a lot to go off of, and you're just kind of scheming. You're just kind of scheming the offense. So I think as we go, we've got to be careful, obviously, to make sure that we put in, him in position to be successful. Uh, but at the same time, you know, right now, we just want to make sure that he's playing fast. Uh, he's playing kind of freed up in his mind, um, you know, to make the plays he's been making. I mean, the kid, did he, he walked on at Old Dominion, Doug. It's a, this is an incredible story. And then you, you couple him with Quez and with Hightower and – when when uh, Rager comes back, and then you've got Alshon and Deshaun. This is a group that is an interesting mix. How will you approach this group moving forward? You know, I, I'm really hoping that that here in the next couple of weeks, we we finally have the guys that we thought we were going into the season with, right? And and that's that's been probably you know the one thing that's that's been kind of you know I don't want to say disappointing because injuries obviously happen in this league, but we haven't had all those guys. We haven't had Alshon out there yet. Deshaun's only had a couple of games. You know, Rager's missed 
quite a bit of time now. So being able to get all these guys and then and then you mix in Travis and G Ward and uh, you know Quez had an opportunity Sunday to play a little bit and and JJ. I mean it's 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 a group that can can be dynamic. I, I really do believe they can be dynamic. I think I think Carson has a comfort level with with all of those guys. We have to continue to to build and grow and and you know as we game plan you know, we'll continue to make decisions that are that are best for the football team and the best for the offense, you know, to get ready for Sunday. As we speak, we don't know about Lane Johnson. I'm keeping my fingers crossed here um, that he's going to be able to play on Sunday and moving forward. So how do you feel about the O-line based on a few games now that you've seen this group together? You know, we went into, we went into Sunday's game with the starting five the second week in a row. For the first time? For the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and we don't know about Lane Johnson. We're we're going to be optimistic there, but waiting on some some results there, and and hopefully that that comes back positive. But hey, listen, if not, Jack Driscoll's he, he he's been he's been the guy that's been out there the most, right? Playing that right tackle spot for Lane, and and has done well. You know, Malata has stepped in over there for for JP, and and he's done well. And you know, sometimes sometimes these young players are just eager to get out on the football field and, and uh, you know, they want to be coached and want to be shown how to do things. And, you know, if, if Lane is not there, then, then you know, we're, we're missing four out of our five starters, right? And and that's, that's hard to overcome. But one of the things that I know and what I see is those guys are they're going to battle. They're going to they're going to compete and they're going to fight and they're going to scratch and they're going to do everything they can to protect the quarterback, to help the run game and and do what's right and best for the team. So, I am excited for the young guys, you know, it's it's a great opportunity for them. Um and, you know, another good test this week with Baltimore. Doug, do you feel the NFC East is still there for the taking? It is. It is. Listen, you know, um it, it's not perfect right now. It's, <clears throat> you know, uh you know, I just got to focus on on us, the Philadelphia Eagles, and get ready for this week. And and um, you know, we just got to find a way to to win games and and um, you know, prepare our prepare you know each week the same and and uh, uh, you know, go play. Final one, Doug. Baltimore, 18 straight games with a takeaway that's longest in the NFL. What do they do so well with that defense? They pressure the quarterback. I mean, they, they put a lot of pressure on. They zero blitz you, which which is all out blitz. Um, in 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 the game, you know, the other day against Cincinnati, I mean, you know, they, they forced the quarterback to to throw the ball up, and, and they got some turnovers there. And you know, it's just something that uh, as we take a look at the tape this week and put the game plan together, we'll be you know prepared for that. Uh, it's an aggressive style on defense, much like Pittsburgh uh, was, you know. So. Um, it's going to take a it's going to take a really good effort this week in practice to prepare for all that and and then and then play on Sunday. Home sweet home on Sunday at Lincoln Financial Field. Doug Peterson, thanks so much. Travis Fogum walked on at Old Dominion University. He was a sixth round draft pick by the Detroit Lions, and the Eagles signed him without one ounce of fanfare in August to the training camp roster. All of a sudden, number 13 is a big-time playmaker, and he intends to keep on making plays in this Eagles offense. I had a chance to talk to Travis on Tuesday, a little get-to-know-you session with wide receiver Travis Fogum. Time now to welcome into the Eagles Insider Podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group, Eagles wide receiver Travis Fogum. Travis, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fine, thanks. Hey, uh, is your Twitter working? I know last week you had some problems after it was hacked. Is it back online? Everything's cool? Yes, I finally got it back. It's uh, Everything seems secure now, so we're all good. And, and, and I would imagine your social media is just blown up beyond any sort of recognition. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, taken a, a jump over the past couple of days, but I've had to turn off all the notifications now for that. <laughs> I like to hear that. Okay, let's talk about uh, being in the flow on Sunday in Pittsburgh. What was it like your first time in the NFL in that kind of rhythm? Ten catches, 152, and a touchdown. How did it feel during the course of the game? I mean, it felt amazing. Um, you know, just going out there, I definitely didn't expect more than ten targets or anything close to that. I just going out there doing my job and just – when I'm coming out my break and I see the ball, it's, it's just a blessing, you know. And Carson's doing a great job of putting it on the money every time. I wonder when you watch film, Travis, and you see how you played Sunday versus how you played this previous Sunday versus, you know, practice, it, do you notice a, a, a marked improvement in your technique and in your route running and in everything that you're doing? 
Absolutely. You know, every week you want to get better. Um, even with the little things, even with route running, blocking, all, all aspects of the game you want to improve on. You scored a touchdown on Sunday. You threw the football up in the air. You wondered after the game if you were going to get that ball back. Have you, in fact, gotten that football back? Nah, the, the ball's gone. I, I definitely should have kept it, gave it to my parents, but yeah, uh, that's a goner. That's <laughs> such a rookie mistake, man. Yeah, Come on. Yeah, yeah no, I'll work on that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, oh, Travis, I guess, I guess this is the kind of question the Eagles fans want to know. Is everything that we're seeing, is it for real? I mean, do you feel like you're just now starting this growth, this, this growth that you're going to have, that you've got so much more to learn, but you now know you can do it in the NFL for a sustained period of time? Yeah, well, no predictions. Uh, I'm just going to keep doing my job, keep coming to work, and giving my 100%, and uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, keep executing. I want to talk about your background. It's a fascinating one. Your parents were foreign service officers, so you grew up overseas. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your, your background growing up and, and where, you, where, you, where you spent your time as a kid? Okay, yeah, so my parents worked for, uh, well, they worked for USAID. Um, it helps out uh, developing countries around the world. And I ended up taking my first flight at around four months. Um, lived in Jordan, Egypt, India, and South Africa. Jordan twice. But, um, yeah, it's something I wouldn't give up for the world. Um, living, living overseas really taught me a lot of things and uh, gives me a great appreciation for everything that I have. Do you speak multiple languages? That's one thing I regret. I definitely dropped the ball on that one. But uh, hopefully I'll learn something in the future. At what point did football become part of your life? Uh, my junior year of high school, I ended up transferring schools, and um, I had the opportunity to play another sport. And um, I ended up trying football, and, and, it, uh, and it definitely worked out. Mom and dad were cool with that. They didn't have any say. They didn't say, "Hey, whoa, no, let's let's go, <laughs> let's go with cricket instead." No, nah, no, nah, they definitely didn't say anything like that. <laughs> Did you have to educate your parents on football? Um, my mom, but not my dad. My dad knows football. Um, but uh, my mom, I got her a Footballs for Dummies book uh, a couple of years ago for Christmas. So she's been reading that, catching up on the game. But, uh, yeah, she's learning. Who is the better athlete, mom or dad? <laughs> I can't do that. I can't do that. They, they, both claim, they both claim I got their athletic abilities from them. So okay. I'll, I'll say it's a tie. Okay, that's <laughs> fine. I, I was just curious if whether, whether one was a noted athlete in their, in their day. Well, my, uh, apparently my mom, they both were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they both were. Okay, yeah, good answer. Um, only two years of, of football in high school. Um, how did you kind of make up for the missed time? Getting, you know, m missing just kind of the foundation of the game at an early age? You just got to put in the work. You know, uh, at all times, I mean, throughout, throughout my uh, career, I've just been putting in extra work. Um, during the off seasons, I take it very seriously, trying to learn new skills, just watching a bunch of different receivers and how they – how they take their, how they how they take their approach to the game, you know, attacking corners, just just picking up on the little things that get you open throughout the game. Who did you love watching when you were a kid? Favorite was Randy Moss. You know, it was exciting when he played for the Patriots. But um, yeah, he was definitely a big receiver that I always watched. I admit, Travis, I've read a lot up on you. Um, you went to ODU as a walk-on. You got awarded a scholarship at the end of fall practice, I guess. Uh, what was that? Was it a ceremony? Did they surprise you? Do you remember that moment? It had to be a significant moment in your life. Oh, yes. It was definitely a significant moment in my life. Um, I think it was about a week into camp. I had a a pretty good week of camp. Definitely was balling out there. And um, the day, actually, my dad was going to pay for uh, the, the first semester, I got the scholarship. And he was like, uh, where do I pay? And I was like, you don't have to. And then so, yeah, so... My parents were very excited after that, and uh, it was definitely a blessing for me and my family. That's very cool. I I've also read that in high school, you had a coach that was really instrumental in your life. Can you talk about that and how the development in the early part of your career really helped build the foundation? I mean, all of my coaches throughout my process were very, were very uh, instrumental for me for becoming the player that I am today. You know, it's just coming into the sport. Um, Coming to, into the sport at first, didn't really know much, but the coaches definitely took their time with me, and I, I appreciate all of them. All right, at ODU, you had a bunch of big games, one of them against Virginia Tech, nine catches, 188. Did you feel that was the moment that maybe I can play at the NFL level? Did, did you feel it at that time? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, but even if it wasn't for that game, I always thought I had the skills to play in the NFL, and um, that just kind of proved it that day. How big is the jump from college to the NFL? 
Um, I wouldn't say it's anything too crazy. It's definitely a lot of more athletes out there, but it's um, nothing that I can't handle. Okay, you're very you're taking this very low key. And are, are you inside, um, ultra super excited about what has happened here, Travis, or are you kind of just letting it letting it take its course one day at a time? Yeah, just one day at a time. Just trying to stay mellow throughout this whole process. Just stay the person that I have been uh, the whole time. It's is it hard to stay mellow with all the attention? No, it's nothing too crazy. Like I said, I've silenced my phone. I'm just staying in the playbook, watching film, and doing what I need to do. What is the daily message from wide receivers coach Aaron Moorhead? Execute and details. You know, we have a young group, so we're all learning, and we're all uh, picking up stuff from each other, and we just need to go out there and uh, play loose and uh, do what we need to do. Travis, what do you think you're good at, and what do you think you need the most work on? Let's see. I, <laughs> I feel like I'm just... I feel like I'm a good playmaker. You know, if the ball's in the air, just come down with it at all times. Um, I could work on many things in my game. I'm, I'm, I'm nowhere close to where I need to be, but um, every day I'll keep improving. That's awesome. Travis, thank you so much. Thanks for joining the podcast here. Continue good luck. Your parents, I guess, will be in the stands on Sunday, Lincoln Financial Field. Yep. If you score a touchdown, what are you going to do with that ball? Give it to them. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Travis Fogum, thanks so much for joining the podcast. All right, thank you. Raise a glass to that comforting feeling of an Eagles touchdown with the all-new Broad and Patterson Wine Collection created in partnership with Wink, featuring a Cabernet, a Rosé, and a Chardonnay. Broad and Patterson Wines are the perfect pairing for any occasion. Now you can bring the sweet taste of victory with you to a dinner with friends or to the tailgate with your game day crew. Purchase online today at philadelphiaeagles.com wine to stock up and have Broad and Patterson delivered right to your door. A portion of proceeds from every bottle benefit Eagles Autism Foundation. The Baltimore Ravens have been one of the best teams in the AFC for the last couple of seasons, but they've had trouble in the playoffs. They haven't broken through. Is this the year that they do it? Well, I'm going to go to the source now. The voice of the Baltimore Ravens, Jerry Sandusky. A lot of the conversation, of course, is pointed at the quarterback, Lamar Jackson, one of the dynamic playmakers in the NFL, who will be a big-time handful for the Eagles on Sunday. Jerry, I, I guess I want to start with the quarterback, and but give me the quarterback from your perspective. I can imagine that once you got a load of what Lamar Jackson was all about, doing the play-by-play, it must have taken your enjoyment level of watching football to a new to a new height. Am I correct in that? Oh yeah, because he you know he does things that no other quarterback does. He does things that are completely unexpected, but he also does things that as a play-by-play guy, you you have to really change the way you call a game because his ball skills are so good. He he is a magician with the ball. So if you think he's handed it off, you'll be dead wrong nine out of ten times if you if you if you think that. You have to literally wait and see where the ball is. Which gives me an appreciation for what defensive players go through, you know, because the, 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 the beauty of this offense is that, you know, everybody, you know, high schools all across America run the read option. That's not a new wrinkle. It's, it's the ball skills. It's the inability to see who has the ball. And in that split second of uncertainty, Lamar Jackson has the athleticism to be able to just make things happen that nobody can draw up on a whiteboard or a computer screen. When do you think – he was like he arrived as a player do you remember we all see young quarterbacks and when they develop and that pivotal moment is there something that sticks out with Lamar week seven 2019 season Ravens are in Seattle the Seahawks are five and one Ravens are four and two and it looks like Seattle has the MVP you know it it looks like you know the Seahawks quarterback is, is clearly the, the favorites to win the MVP. And then the Ravens are tied in third quarter, 13-13. It's fourth and short. And Lamar Jackson goes to the sideline and says to John Harbaugh, let's go for it. And Marshall Yonda is right behind the young quarterback. And he says, yeah, let's do it. And so Harbaugh sees Marshall Yonda give his thumb up to it. So he, so he says, go for it. And Jackson not only gets the first down, he gets the touchdown. And from that moment forward, he was the leader. He goes on to become the MVP. And that that was his moment that he had arrived. That's a great story. I, I do want to ask you this. There have been times when he's been contained. And we are certainly hoping that Sunday is one of those times. Um, <laughs> what have teams done to contain him? So if you go back and look at what the Tennessee Titans did in the playoff game last year, and I've seen it now, the Cleveland Browns did it, the Bengals did it this last week. What, what they tend to be doing is they are committing both an edge setter 
and a safety on a delayed blitz to take away the edge. So, you know, to his credit, Lamar Jackson only ran the ball one time against the Bengals. He didn't try to force it. And the, the next thing I see evolving in this Ravens offense is the pass off the read option. Because defenses are doing a great job of using safeties and secondary to come up and string Jackson out along the line of scrimmage. But if you're committing those kind of resources in your secondary, that means the back end has to be open. And I think it's only a matter of time before the Ravens start to exploit that with the true triple threat. I mean, uh, we go back any farther in time, we'll be talking about the single wing. But you know, <laughs> Exactly. That, that's really what this is. It, it's the new version of great athletes playing old school football. Right. I mean, we saw the read option in Philadelphia when Chip Kelly came to town. Ran well, but then they ca- teams caught on to it, and it never evolved after that. And so that was the end of Chip in Philadelphia. Yep, and that's the key. Look, I, I don't care if you are running the read option, if you're running the zone, the outside zone. I don't care if you're running the West Coast offense. Whatever you're running, you have to always evolve because you've got you know young quarterbacks, 24, 25 years old, who are going against defenses that are schemed by coaches who have been doing this for 30 years. So no matter what they see, these guys are all smart. They're going to figure it out, and they're going to have a defense for it. So the offenses have to keep evolving, and the ones that do thrive and the ones that don't tend to be looking for new coaches. Well, even when Lamar is quote-unquote contained, I mean, you you know, Baltimore's 4-1. and one. The offense is really scoring 29 points a game. You're among the best running attacks in the league. I mean, what else is working for the offense? What else can we expect on Sunday from Baltimore's offense? I think what we can start to expect is more consistent execution. You know, it's not that the Ravens are doing things vastly different. It's, you know, they, they lost Marshall Young to, retire, to retirement. There aren't a lot of right guards in the NFL who have that profound an impact on the execution of his team's offense. But Marshall Yonda is is that rare guy, and I think that's one of the reasons he's a Hall of Famer. When you had Marshall Yonda in there, you had a young right tackle in Orlando Brown Jr., he's kind of give he's, you know, he's the second half of Orlando Brown's development. You know, he's, he's giving him the whisper of, look out for this. He's, he's reminding him, look out for that. Well, now you have either, you know, a veteran backup, a second-year guy, or a rookie guard, at the right side, so you have Orlando Brown Jr. having to help him out, which is impacting Orlando Brown's physical performance in a negative way, and that's very natural. When you take away the most important piece on an offensive line, everybody else in that line is going to struggle for a little while, finding their way, coming together as a cohesive unit. This week, I expect to see this offensive line start to be the offensive line we saw last year, which is a unit that works well together, that executes at a high level, that creates the opportunities for Mark Ingram, for Lamar Jackson, now for J.K. Dobbins to have the creases they need to turn four-yard plays into 14-yard plays. And you start stringing those together over the course of four quarters. That's how the Ravens wear teams out. It's it's kind of like the boxing philosophy of body blow, body blow, body blow, jab, 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 hook. And the hook doesn't come in the first quarter. It comes in the fourth quarter. Yeah, and by that time, the defense is – Got at least one takeaway because that's all you do is take the football away. Uh, Baltimore defense is as good as it usually has been. Yeah, and, and probably better than what we've seen in the last couple of years because in the last two weeks, the pass rush has really started to come on. They had seven sacks against the Bengals. They had three sacks the, the week before that against the Washington football team. So they're, they're starting to get the pressure up front. It, it's the best secondary, I think we've ever seen certainly the best cornerback combination we've ever seen from the Ravens. But what, what makes this a true Ravens defense, I think is the arrival of Patrick queen, the first round pick from LSU who is only the third inside linebacker. The Ravens have ever used a number one draft pick on. And the other two were Ray Lewis and CJ Mosley. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an idea of what they think of this kid. He plays with tremendous speed. He can go sideline to sideline. He's really strong in coverage and he's a big hitter. And as we saw against the Bengals, he's an opportunist. He had a sack, a forced fumble, and a fumble recovery on the same play, and then a fumble recovery in the fourth quarter that he took 52 yards for a touchdown. So when you look at the evolution of the Ravens' defense, what's old is new. When they're really good, they've got a great inside linebacker, and I think they have one again. Clearly, you believe the Ravens are a Super Bowl contending team. You know, I'll be honest with you, it's October. I don't think anybody's a Super Bowl contending team in October. 
Dave, the years have taught me that the teams you think are a lock for the Super Bowl in September, something happens to them in October, November, and the same with October, November. You know, the, the years the Ravens went to the Super Bowl were years where, you know, the first time they had, they had six straight games they didn't score a touchdown. Nobody thought they were going to the Super Bowl. And in, in 2012, when they went to the Super Bowl, they were terrible in December and looked like they'd be one and done in the playoffs. So last year, we thought they were a lock. We thought, oh, yeah, okay, who's the NFC going to send to play against the Ravens? Top seed, home field advantage, and they were one and done in the playoffs. So time has taught me to be very humble and respectful of the words Super Bowl and not to get too sure of who's going to get there ahead of time. Yeah, and certainly in this unpredictable 2020, um, who knows from week to week, how, how are the Ravens looking this week for injuries? So far, so good. They came, they came out of the, uh, the win against the Bengals in, in pretty good shape. They, they lost a special teams player, Matero Alaka, who's, who's a quality special teams player. They did lose him to a season-ending injury. But Ronnie Stanley, the left tackle, was back last week and looks good. Lamar Jackson missed a couple of days practice last week. Had a sore knee and then had an illness. John Harbaugh believes that he will be at practice every day this week, so... You know, all things considered, the Ravens are a fairly healthy football team for mid-October. I really thank you, Jerry. I want to see this team up close in person and see what Jim Schwartz has planned. He's one of those coordinators who's been around for 30 years. Let's see what he has planned for a very versatile offense on Sunday. That's the beauty of this game, isn't it? Every Sunday we went to see what will the brains do against the athletes. That will do it for this episode of the Eagles Insider Podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Thanks to Peter Kelly, Trevor Hayes, and Ray Doyle for their work. Thanks to all of you for joining us. If you have a moment to give us a five-star review, please, 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 thank you very much. It helps a whole lot both inside the walls of the NovaCare Complex and in attracting more fans to the podcast. I'm Insider Dave Spadaro. Thanks again for joining, everyone. Have yourselves a great Eagles day, and fly, Eagles, fly. E-A-T-L-E-S, Eagles! We want you to know about all the podcasts in the Eagles network of podcasts. So make sure you tune into not only this Eagles Insider podcast three times a week, but make sure you subscribe and listen to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast every Tuesday and Thursday, our Journey to the Draft podcast Tuesday and Thursday, and our Eagles Update podcasts, which give you the news in a flash Monday through Saturday throughout this 2020 season. Sign up, subscribe, and listen to our Eagles network of podcasts.